the debaters tonight. Uh, Peter Hanfield has had a distinguished career in journalism. He's been a correspondent for the Sunday Times, the Sunday Telegraph, and the Daily Mail. For 14 years, he was the Tokyo correspondent for New Scientist. He trained as a geologist, and he currently runs a YouTube channel called the Pot Solo 54, which has attracted over 86,000 subscribers. David Warden, oh, he's chair of Dorset Humanist. <laughs> he's not a scientist by trade, but he has developed an obsessive and unhealthy interest in the science related to climate change. Would you please give a vote for a warm welcome. Science is the sort of thing which can be reduced 
to 10 minute videos, although he has done about 30 of them. Second, Peter's tone tends to be very scathing and triumphant. He puts up an art sign and then gives it a good thwacking. And third, in order to criti critically evaluate his videos, you have to watch them over and over again in order to catch all of the scientific references which can flash past very quickly. This is why I prefer books and printed material in general. You can read at your own pace and scribble notes and questions on the printed page. Now I'm just going to get this uh, come up again. Um, now one of the disputes in climate change is over the funding of climate scepticism. It seems that every climate change sceptic is secretly funded by evil free enterprise institutes based in America. Well, the answer to this problem, as Nigel Lawson has proposed, is for the government to fund sceptical science, which is what it should be doing. One of the key proponents of anthropogenic climate change, Jim Hansen, said this about the scientific method. In science, you want to examine evidence that seems to disagree with your preliminary interpretation. You must evaluate contradictory evidence to make sure that you are not fooling yourself. Well, until budget holders are prepared to be even-handed in the distribution of research funding and to fund research into evidence which may contradict the hypothesis of dangerous anthropogenic climate change, then we're not going to get away from privately funded research and the ever-present suspicion that it's contaminated and misleading. But at the end of the day, science is science. Even if Satan himself is providing the funding, science should be able to maintain its own integrity. And there are plenty of scientific papers published in mainstream journals which cast doubt on the hypothesis of dangerous, dangerous anthropogenic climate change. One of the key complaints of, of the sceptics is that these papers are simply ignored or downplayed by the IPCC. One, one aspect of the debate I'd like to draw attention to is the way in which facts can be presented or spun in different ways to support different conclusions. My favourite one is this. Now, the increase in... Uh, CO2 emissions can be shown as a rising slope on the left there, or as a straight line, depending on which scale you use. Now these are just two ways of expressing the same fact, but they have dramatically different emotional and intellectual impacts. So I think we need to be alert to the effect of graphs and presentations. I don't know which one of those you prefer, but it's actually presenting exactly the same fact. Uh, the way in which CO2 emissions are accumulating in the atmosphere. Can you, can you actually see the, the line on the, on the bottom right? It's basically a straight line on the bottom left. Another aspect of the debate I'd like to draw attention to is what's known as confirmation bias. I was having breakfast with an old friend at the weekend who seemed to imply that anthropogenic climate change is real because we had so much rain last winter. <laughs> well, I thought it was something to do with the jet stream. Climate scientists usually avoid linking any particular weather events with global warming. What they say instead is that extreme weather events are consistent with a hypothesis of anthropogenic climate change. Well, yes. But extreme weather events are also consistent with the theory that the gods are punishing us for immorality. But this doesn't lend any credibility to the god hypothesis. A scientific approach would have to demonstrate two things. One, that extreme weather events are increasing in frequency, and two, that anthropogenic climate change is the main culprit. Peter and I agree that we should avoid loaded terms like climate denialism and climate alarmism. Peter refers to climate change proponents and climate change sceptics. Or critics, rather. Okay, critics. He disagrees with the sceptics, critics, uh, but he doesn't think that climate scepticism or criticism per se is a crime against humanity. 
The basic physics indicates that a doubling of carbon dioxide, all else being equal, is known to cause atmospheric warming of just over 1 degree centigrade. The difficult problem is assessing the net effect of positive and negative feedback, such as clouds, water vapour, and the reflection of incoming solar radiation. Taking feedback into account, a doubling of CO2 could cause atmospheric warming of anywhere between 1.5 degrees centigrade and 4.5 degrees, and this range comes from the IPCC. So this is where the debate really lies between these two figures. 1.5 degrees of warming is probably not dangerous, but 4.5 degrees of warming certainly would be. Peter thinks we're heading for the higher end, whereas the so-called sceptics or critics argue for the lower end. Well, I'm not qualified to be able to judge who is right, but I can quote scientific papers which give best estimates for climate sensitivity in the lower range of 1.6 to 2 degrees. I'm not going to bore you with all of the, uh, the actual hate just by reading off the, the names of the papers, but uh, we don't have time this evening to evaluate all of these papers. But if you want to look up the references, uh, you can have a transcript of my talk and see for yourself if they've been misquoted or taken out of context. And I look forward to hearing from you. Well, since 2009, there's been an almighty row about whether global warming has paused. The scientific consensus now appears to be that global warming has plateaued for about 16 or 17 years. The IPCC calls this a hiatus. This is not what computer models predicted, and so it's become one of the key battlegrounds between components and critics. In one of his videos, global warming has stopped again, 2012, Peter refers to the tired old myth that global warming was stopped. In the video, he pulls scorn on a report in the Daily Mail that the Met Office had issued a report that there had been no global warming for 16 years. The Met Office report turned out to be fictional. The Skeptical Science website also includes this in its top 10 list of climate myths. Thank you, Matt, for that particular reference. Matt's always sending me links from the Skeptical Science website. This is sceptical about scepticism, isn't it? That um, well, let's look at a paper by another journalist, Dr. David Whitehouse, who was a BBC science correspondent and science editor of the BBC News uh, Online. His paper, The Global Warming Standstill, argues that the Met Office has indeed conceded that there has been a warming standstill for over a decade. He writes this, it's incontrovertible that the global annual average temperature of the past decade, and in some data sets the past 15 years, has not increased. Year-on-year -year fluctuations and any trend over this period are within errors of measurement. The only justifiable statistical description of the global temperature during this period is a constant. Technically, this standstill can be seen in the data sets produced by NOAA, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. NASA, the best consortium, had CRUX 3 and especially its successor, had CRUX 4. I love that acronym, had CRUX. Um, they don't know what that stands for? Beautiful um, It's, it's a, a combination of temperature records compiled compar compiled by the Hadley Centre of the UK Met Office and the Climatic Research Unit of the University of Australia. Well, this standstill has occurred as atmospheric uh, CO2 has increased from 370 parts per million to 390 parts per million. Uh, David Whitehouse writes this, some journalists have shown too much zeal in wishing to demolish the scientific case for the standstill and not enough journalistic inquisitiveness in investigating it. To their surprise, the standstill has not gone away as they expected. Some have uncritically accepted one side of the debate as to its existence and looked the other way when a different view was presented. 
making the unwarranted assumption that the standstill is only advocated by sceptics. Often journalists have been years behind the scientific debate about this issue. They need to pay more attention to the science of global warming and not just its scores. Well, I'm sure Peter would agree with that. Whitehouse writes that a simple observation was at first ridiculed, then dismissed, and then accepted as scientific fact, taking its place as one of the key findings of recent climate science. Well, in a 2007 email, Phil Jones of the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia referred to the idiots who continue to spout this nonsense. In 2009, in another email, Jones wrote, the no upward trend has to continue for a total of 15 years before we get worried. In 2010, Jones was interviewed by Roger Harabin of the BBC. Harabin asked, do you agree that from 1995 to the present there has been no statistically significant global warming? Jones replied, We live in the warmest decade. No one doubts that, though possibly not as warm as it was a thousand, two thousand, and three thousand years ago. And this explains why the world's warmest years are clustered during that period. There is no upward trend, just a plateau. White House, White House writes, the fact that we live in the warmest decade in the instrumental record is not in doubt. The question of the long-term trend being unabated is contentious. Natural variability was regarded by many as the explanation for the temperature hiatus, but no one could agree on what kind of natural variability. In 2011, the UK Met Office issued a report called Evidence, the State of the Climate, which offered explanations for the recent lack of warming. It stated, the temperature rise is inexorable, despite short-term variations. Well, this sounds to me as if global warming has become unfalsifiable. How can temperature rise be inexorable if it's not inexorable, and in fact has plateaued? Well, the Met Office said that it believed that the standstill is probably partly caused by the low solar activity of the past decade, coupled with the influence of stratospheric water vapour variations. This is because a decrease in stratospheric water vapour cools the troposphere. Uh, the troposphere, in case you don't know, is the lower bit of the atmosphere, up to 10 kilometres, and the stratosphere is above the troposphere. Well, maybe so, but if solar activity and stratospheric water vapour can cause 0.2 degrees of cooling in recent years, then presumably they can also do the opposite and be responsible, or partly responsible, for warming in previous decades. Well, I think you can see the, the recent plateau in this graph. Uh, so just to briefly explain what you can see there, this is uh, from 1950 to 2010. Um, obviously the line goes up and down, and we can draw lines, you know, we can pick any two points we like and, and sort of bring different things. But I think in general, the general impression you can see between 1950 and 1980, not, not an awful lot was happening on average, and then between 1980 and 1997, we can say there's a definite increase in temperature. Um, and then in the last decade, now I know there are a couple of spikes there. The first spike is the 1998 El Nino, and 2010 was another El Nino year. So if you kind of discount those two, you can see that there's a bit of a plateau in the last part of the graph, and that's, that's what we're talking about. And all of, the, all of the lines on that graph are from unimpeachable sources such as the Met Office um, and the Goddard Institute of Space Studies. Well, in 2012, the veteran scientist James Lovelock was quoted as saying, the problem is we do not know what the climate is doing. We thought we knew 20 years ago. That led to some alarmist books, mine included, because it looks clear cut but it has not happened. The climate is doing its usual tricks. There's nothing much really happening yet. We were supposed to be halfway towards a frying world now. 
The world has not warmed up very much since the millennium. Twelve years is a reasonable time. The temperature has stayed almost constant, whereas it should have been rising. In an interview with the Australian, uh, and I'm struggling to pronounce his name, so you may have to help me out, um, the chair of the IPCC, Rajendra Pachuri, uh, acknowledged the reality of the post-1997 standstill in global average temperatures, but he asserted that it will take a temperature standstill of 30 to 40 years at least to affect theories of man-made global warming. Well, David Whitehouse writes this. Some argue that the duration of the standstill is too short to be meaningful. 30 years is taken to be the baseline for observing climate changes, and 15 years is too short. He argues that 15 years is not an insignificant period. What has happened to make temperatures remain constant requires an explanation. The years of constant temperature are about equal to years when the temperatures increase. So referring to 1980 to 97. This is not a trivial observation, he writes. He says that we are on the threshold of global observations becoming incompatible with the consensus theory of climate change. The key bit is coming up, and I'm nearly done, and I'll hand over to Peter in just a moment. He writes this in the past decade, the atmospheric CO2 levels have increased from 370 to 390 parts per million. Using those figures, the IPCC once estimated that the world should have warmed by at least 0.2 degrees centigrade. The world's failure to warm at all means that all the other climatic factors have had a net effect of producing 0.2 degrees of cooling. Therefore, these other factors must be at least as important as anthropogenic influences. Well, as I mentioned earlier, if climatic factors such as solar activity and stratospheric water vapour can cause 0.2 degrees of cooling, then presumably they can also have caused 0.2 degrees of warming in previous decades. The real problem we have in climate science is disentangling a mass of different climate variables. If the anthropogenic signal can be lost for 15 years or 16 years, we should be cautious about claims that it was ever clearly identified in the first place. Thank you very much.
are really a little, not the best sources to use. And, and this is why David and I, in the bulletin, we had this, um, this, this disagreement, a very gentlemanly disagreement, I have to say. Um, he says if you can't read the scientific papers, you have to trust the books. And I say the worst thing you do is trust the books. And I'll show you why in the next uh, few videos. These are some of the books that he cited. Now, I haven't been able to read them, but I do know some of the arguments. Um, and here's another one that you might be familiar with. Um, Evolution Exposed. Uh, here's one, The Greatest Hoax on Earth, uh, showing how um, evolution is a hoax. And this one explains how the Earth is just 6,500 years old. Should we trust books? Well, it depends. I mean, these books uh, were written by biologists and Geologists, and in this particular case, this guy's a research geologist. So, having credentials that you, you are educated in a particular field doesn't mean you get to write a book that's factually accurate because books are not fact checked. As far as the publisher is concerned, what he wants to do is to make sure that the, uh, the book will sell. The parallels are quite interesting because if you're going to accept the word um, uh, the fancy sounding website like the Cato Institute here, um, which is uh, against climate change, and I hate to say it, but it is funded by the Koch brothers who have great interest in, in fossil fuels, and um, Patrick Michaels is a senior uh, researcher. But then you have to, if you're going to believe them, the Hartman Institute, which is another of these political organizations, which funds the NIPC, uh, NIPCC. Then why not believe the Discovery Institute and the Institute of Creation Research? So I'm going to have to move the microphone a little bit because I'm a bit of a little bit of a The Global Warming Policy Foundation, which uh, I think um, I think you referenced that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to believe that, what about impact, which uh, it says here is like articles on uh, science and creation. Uh, Energy and Environment, which is a journal uh, produced um, for papers that are, let's say, contrarian, critical of climate science. Then why not believe the Journal of Creation? Um, the parallels are quite interesting. We've even got a global warming petition where thousands of scientists, from dentists to wood engineers, signed this petition to say global warming isn't happening. And you've got a similar one from the uh, creationists saying that evolution is a nonsense. And of course, we have the censorship of um, creationists who want to put their scientific papers into journals. And they're censored. They're not allowed to put this stuff in there for obvious reasons. Um, we also, um, I'm sorry, I've got those the other way around. That's the one on global warming, uh, where there was one a paper that was rejected uh, by, for publication because it was a bit of nonsense, um, and the uh, journal rightly said so. So the parallels are quite interesting, and I think you, you need to think clearly about this, and if you really want to accept what you're reading in these internet sites, I noticed David has referenced three people, none of whom is a um, uh, professional climate researcher in his talk. And unfortunately, so many of the myths that I get given come from these kinds of websites. Um, so I think you ought to ask yourself, well, you know, is it really the case that um, there's so much different from the, from the creationist one? The idea is that this is a formula which unfortunately is very prevalent these days for undermining science. And this is not true just for evolution and climatology, it's all, also true for things like the efficacy of vaccinations, where we've got this scare campaign in the internet and books everywhere saying that if vaccinations cause autism, the result of which parents aren't vaccinating their kids. So this misunderstanding, misrepresentation of science is actually quite a dangerous thing. Uh, the idea is basically to slow down in the public mind. But I want to move on to actually check some of the facts, because as I said, the books are not fact-checked, so we have to do the fact-checking ourselves. Now, to fact-check these books, you don't need to go crawling through the scientific literature to look for counter-arguments. You don't even need a science degree. Basically, all you need to do is check the primary sources. Um, and David and I have, uh, have talked about this, as he mentioned. If a source is cited, you just find the source and compare it to the claim. And I'm going to start with this claim by uh, Patrick Michaels, who, who wrote that book. And he, he basically castigated the press for saying that uh, Greenland's ice cap is melting. And he said it may be melting at the edges, but it's gaining ice in the interior, and the two balance each other out. And he cites a source, which is a paper by Thomas et al. And, and he also cites another paper by Crabble. 
et al. and of the Thomas paper, he quotes it here, and he says, the whole region has been in balance. That's a quote from the paper. And Michael Seffel concludes, therefore the overall ice is pretty much in balance, talking about the whole Greenland ice sheet. But as I said, to check your claim, you have to go to the primary source. So here it is. Uh, this is the paper by uh, Thomas. And we discovered that Thomas didn't say the whole region has been in balance at all. What he said was the region has been in balance. And what Michaels did, you can see there, that's what he said. And what Michaels did is put the word, oh, and sorry, when he's talking about the region, he's talking about higher elevations above 2,000 meters. That area of Greenland above 2,000 meters is in balance. But what Michael does is he inserts the word whole and then gives the spurious conclusion that the whole of Greenland's ice is in balance and therefore Greenland's ice is not melting, so all these press reports will be rubbish. This comes from someone who's supposed to be a science researcher writing a book that has not been fact checked. So it really does pay just to check the papers and see if they say what the guy says they do. Now, that conclusion is not just in contradiction of what Thomas said, it's also in contradiction with the other paper that was cited by. Cravel et al. <coughs> and this is the paper. Uh, Cravel's paper didn't conclude that the ice, whole ice sheet was in balance. It concluded the exact opposite. Right there in the abstract, and I'm surprised Michael didn't see that, it says that there's a net melting of 51 cubic kilometers every year, 51 billion tons. Now, ev every other study since then has confirmed this. And in fact, more recent studies have shown that the amount is much larger because that milk is accelerating. So Michaels didn't even try to rebut findings of papers he cited. He simply didn't mention them. If Michaels has submitted his research to a respected peer-reviewed scientific journal, the mistake would have been spotted in an instant, and this piece of nonsense would have been rejected, probably to cries of scientific censorship. But Michaels rarely publishes in respected scientific journals. He publishes most of his claims in books and blogs that aren't fact checked. Now, he seems like a very trustworthy fellow because he is a qualified environmental scientist. So, you know, no problem with his credentials. But he also owns a PR firm called New Hope Environmental Services, which is paid hundred thousand dollars by fossil fuel companies to downplay the role of the CO2 in climate change. These aren't secret payments. This isn't, well, actually, some of them were until they were uncovered. But, I mean, you know, this is, this is not to, to say that these are evil. I don't put the adjective <laughs> evil in front of them. I don't know this David did. I don't say they're evil. They're looking after their in, own interests. They are publishing books and putting out websites the same as any company would do. I think it's not their fault. I think it's our fault for believing this stuff and not checking it. Um, so Michaels appears all the time, as you can see on the television programs. Hey, um, putting forward the case of the people that are paying him, which is that CO2 is nothing to worry about, until he got to the point where he was asked a, a question on one particular interview, which I hope, if this is going to work, I'll be able to show you. I find it puzzling that people who call themselves skeptics 
are so unskeptical they're prepared to believe whatever these authors write just because they sound very convincing and they claim to be citing real scientific papers. I'll look at a couple more of these representations while showing some evidence um, about climate change. By the way, if you tell me I've got five minutes left and then I can rush through the rest. I, I want to answer three basic questions, which um, which basically gives you the format of how, how this, this, this whole CO2 thing progressed. Because a lot of big people seem to think it started 10 years ago without law. So the three questions I want to look at is, where's the evidence that CO2 causes warming? Or what's the evidence that CO2 causes warming? What's the evidence it's done that in the past? And what's the evidence that it's doing this now? Well, uh, the first one is quite easy, because um, the... 19th century, it was uh, experiments found that CO2 let shortwave radiation through, which is the kind of radiation you get from sunlight. And then when that bounces back off the Earth, that forms longer wave radiation, which, as heat, normally goes out into space. It's carbon dioxide uh, that uh, blocks it, along with water vapor. Uh, there's a difference between the two, which I'll explain later, but they work on different wavelengths, for one thing. And over 100 years ago, it's been rain is calculated that more CO2 would therefore cause the Earth to warm. Now, since then, dozens of papers were published, 1938, 1959, uh, 569, 72, and 79. Uh, now, David said that in the 1970s, uh, scientists predicted global cooling, which I've had so many times I can't remember how much I had to rebut this. It was based on um, a couple of articles in Time and Newsweek. But Time and Newsweek are not scientific journals. So if anybody has heard this myth, I'm here to tell you that a scientific a survey was done of these scientific papers and it found that the vast majority of researchers in the 60s and 70s were predicting warming, the same as they had done since the 1890s. And that prediction came true. At the time, the Earth actually was cooling because of aerosol pollution. And when the aerosol pollution was cleared in the 70s through new amount of pollution laws, and one of the scientists correctly predicted that's when we're going to see the effects of warming coming in. So if CO2 causes warming in theory, uh, we should be able to see it in the Earth's geological history. Now, according to Bob Carter, we don't. And I'm going to play a little clip of Bob Carter here. It's another of the authors. On this scale is the number of times that number. So this is 5, 10, 15 times the base count mark. Well, now we're up the oceans with a boil away. Surely, well, you know that. They just go, ooh, the count marks, well, it'll literally boil the oceans, but it didn't. Okay, um, it didn't, and uh, Carter's absolutely right. Um, leaving aside the myth that the oceans would boil away. I don't know where you got that from. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the theory doesn't seem to work, does it? You've got 15 times as much carbon dioxide today, and the Earth was in fact frozen at one point. Half a billion years ago, CO2 levels were 15 times higher, and the Earth should have experienced extreme global warming. But before we assume that Carter has single-handedly smashed that the, the hoax, CO2 is strongly in global temperatures, remember what to do. We check the primary source. Now, this is the graph he was using, which comes from a paper by Royer, and it's this paper. Now, when you start actually checking sources, you begin to see uh, where a lot of the mistakes are made, or at least the misinterpretation of the papers. Here's the original graph, which is in the paper, which is the one that Carter was referencing. Now, if we overlay these against temperature over the last 500 million years, well, let's have a look at the two together. Obviously, there's no correlation. So, Carter's apparently right. But the conclusion of the source that he cites, which is Royer, says exactly the opposite. Royer, in the same paper, says that there is a pervasive type correlation between CO2 and temperatures. Now, how can it be that the paper that Carter is citing says there's a very tight cor correlation, and Carter is somehow misinterpreting this and says there's none? Maybe there's something that's in Royer's paper that Carter is not telling us. And here it is. Over the last 500 million years, in fact, the last five, 5 billion years since the sun uh, first, first began, it's been growing in strength. So we've been having increasing solar output. Uh, about 500 million years ago, the solar output was about 5% lower than today. And it's this lower heat from the 
the sun that offset the warming effect of a large amount of CO2. In fact, before CO2 levels grew, the solar output was so low that for several million years the Earth was almost entirely covered in ice. What eventually thawed the planet was accumulating CO2 ejected by volcanoes. At least that is the theory, and no one's been able to uh, come up with any alternative, reaching levels 20 times higher than today. Now, the warming continued even after all the ice had melted until all the planet was ice free and we had coral reefs at the North Pole. So the Earth was a hot house at a time when the sun was 5% weaker than today. Five minutes. Now, five minutes old. <laughs> Over the next 500 million years, uh, uh, so CO2 levels slowly fell uh, from 500 million years ago to now, at the same time that the sun has been strengthening. They fell because of weathering and sedimentation locked it up in limestone, coal and oil were most of the today. And a good thing too, because as CO2 levels have been dropping, solar output has been strengthening. In short, the sequestration of CO2 has kept the Earth from overheating as the sun gets hotter. The last thing we want to do is start putting it back up there. Uh, so if you plot CO2 and uh, solar output and put both of those factors in there and measure that against global temperature, you actually get a very good correlation between CO2 and global, uh, global temperature. Um, okay, well, I'll very quickly go on to uh, this graph, which... Um, I haven't got enough time to go through all the rubbish. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> there, there's uh, the stuff I want to talk about the NIPC, uh, NIPCC, but I'll, I'll just uh, finish on this. Um, this was a graph um, that David used that. Um, sorry, I wasn't perky when I was talking about rubbish, by the way. I was talking about rubbish in my book, so it's more than that. This is uh, a graph that David used which shows the hockey stick, where the familiar um, temperature curve and the 1990 IPCC um, paper, which had this graph in showing temperatures, you can see they're both in the year 2000. The IPCC apparently changed this curve into this one uh, in the space of 10 years. Why? Well, there must be some sort of conspiracy going on, unless you actually go to the source. Now, I, I asked him where he got this, and he said it came from a website called Moon Battery. And I checked Moon Batteries. There it is, that's from Moon Battery. Moonbattery.com is actually a political website. You'll find when you actually track these things back, they do come for a lot of political websites, uh, which also says that the Bible ver uh, verses contain hidden healing messages. Uh, so if you believe one, you have to believe the other. <laughs> this is the actual graph from the 1990 uh, IPCC report. Now, you, can, you might be able to notice a few differences in the way it was laid out by this, um, this website. For one thing, uh, the original IPCC report is actually a schematic diagram. It comes from a 1965 paper by a uh, researcher called H.H. Lamb. It's got no temperature scale on the side, but look at how it's been changed when it goes to this website. All of a sudden, a scale appears and it becomes a graph rather than a schematic diagram. Another difference, you can see that it's marked years before present. Before present, BP, in geological terms, means before 1950. That was used as a standard. So this graph actually only goes up to 1950. What have they done with it when they put it on the website? They've taken it up to the year 2000 in order to match this one to pretend there's a difference. In fact, it ends about here. So... Uh, Knowing that they have manipulated this, I think you can see why it's worth checking these things. Um, and this is the other graph that uh, superseded it, which is the one of 1999 by Man Bradley Hughes, MBH99 school. Um, and that also is slightly different, but at the same time, why did the IPCC, or maybe it's my last point, <laughs> I promise you, why did the IPCC get rid of that? Schematic, which ended in 1950, and which, by the way, was measuring temperatures in central England. It wasn't even a global thing. It was only central England where maybe the warm period is, is actually more pronounced. Why did they get rid of that in favour of something that was up to date, that was global, and actually had a temperature scale because it had been measured? <coughs> well, I think that just answered my own question. And yet there's a conspiracy about this. Now, there, there were statistical problems with this graph. But David and I disagreed with this one, let's say, on, in, in email exchanges, because he said, you don't really 
believe this, what is it last year? I said, well, prove me wrong. <laughs> By all means, I would love to hear why that uh, hockey stick graph, uh, as it's been colloquially known, is, is not valid. Um, and I think that my time is up now, uh, so the rest of it will have to wait. Um, but anyway, answer a few basic questions, and the rest of it we'll have to see how we can rest of it. Right. 
A good scientist never does that. A good scientist has to have a hypothesis based on, on realistic uh, observations and then try to prove that wrong, not try to prove it right. Science is skeptical. The idea that, that the government should be funding skeptical science, to me, sounds like the government should be funding science. Well, they are already doing that. Uh, so I think that's maybe a misperception of the way science operates. Okay, but then I, I would come back and say, you know, are the crit critical um, climate scientists, or skeptical if you want to call them that, are they actually part of that scientific development? Absolutely, if they publish, they want to publish their, uh, I mean like Michael's, if he wants to say Greenland's ice is not melting, and I can prove it, because I read this paper that says so, well let him publish this, and, and then it will be peer reviewed, and contrary to what a lot of people think, peer review doesn't mean that, uh, oh if we don't like the paper, it doesn't fit with our theory, we, don't, we reject it, it's actually the opposite, if it fits with the theory, it's not very interesting. The, paper, the kind of papers journals want are the ones that overturn uh, science. Uh, I mean, you know, that's my problem with um, evolution is that uh, you know they always think that scientists are trying to uh, just, can't, as you said, confirmation bias. No, the scientist who's going to win the Nobel Prize is the one who shows that evolution is, is uh, nonsense. That would be so so amazing that, that that would be something that, that would win the Nobel Prize. So that's basically what uh, what the scientists. And, and yeah, your, your so-called skeptical scientists, they're perfectly at liberty to put these papers forward and to publish, and a lot of them do. Uh, Singer has had nine papers published, which is actually tiny compared to the hundreds of papers most of them do. Carter, uh, he's qualified as a stratigrapher and uh, paleontologist. He's written hundreds of book, uh, papers on his particular subject. All of a sudden, he decides he wants to get into paleoclimatology. And he hasn't written a single paper on paleoclimatology, and yet he's written a book on it, and he goes lecturing about it everywhere. So he's welcome. Uh, you know, don't say the debate has been stifled. There's more than enough debate. If you read the scientific literature, read Science, Nature, uh, New Scientist, read read the, the journals. They're full of debate about all kinds of things. But we don't necessarily debate the fact that CO2 causes warming because we already know that. And if I can put a question to you, and most of your talk was taken up with the latest, I'd say, fad um, opposition. <laughs> it used to, actually, funnily enough, it used to be the troposphere. The troposphere isn't warming. This has gone on for years and years and years, and this was a thorn in the side of all climate scientists, because this was the main skeptical argument. And I say skeptical in the inverted commas. Oh, the troposphere is not warming, therefore it's all wrong. It turned out the satellite. That the data that Roy Spencer and John Christie were using, and they're both what you might call skeptics, turned out that they got their data wrong because the satellite was regressing in orbit. So all of their temperature data was complete rubbish, and that was why the mistake was made. We don't necessarily need to wait to iron out every little uh, inconsistency. And since you mentioned the, the pause, um, I mean, this is just uh, basically the latest. I'm interested to know from you, if you, you do you do say that the, the Earth is warming in response to CO2 uh, by, what was it, 1.5 to 2 degrees, I think you said? Well, I said that, I, I quoted the range that was that's quoted by the IPCC. No, the IPCC one, you, you did mention that, 1.5 to 4.5, but you yeah. said that you, I thought it was an higher end, actually I don't, I, I, I don't have anything, I'm not a climate scientist. Okay. So, so but right. you, did, you did say that you thought it was 1.62 degrees, according to my notes. I, well, again, I didn't say that, I said I can quote papers that are on here. Okay, well, well yeah. let, let me put the question to you. What do these papers, and presumably the, the people that say 1.62 degrees, are the people who say, nothing ah, we can worry about, everything's going to be fine. Why do they say global warming has stopped or paused or whatever it is? If, if CO2 is supposed to cause 1.62 degrees of warming, they must have an explanation for why it's not doing that. I'd like to know what that is. Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't really have an answer for that. Uh, <laughs> but it's an interesting question, you see. It's, it's a bit of a paradox for them to say, yes, CO2 does fall so, Yeah, okay, sorry, I've still still an answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I think what, okay, what they were saying is that um, a doubling of, of CO2 is likely to cause, say, 1.6 to 2, 3 centigrade. So yeah. they are kind of saying, don't look at it on the time scale. I mean, but, but uh, so, yeah, put your finger on it. 
<laughs> but that's it, isn't it? I mean, oh yeah, you know, you know, if you've seen over the last 500 million years, CO2 is not a short-term effect for a climate. And we've seen that after the Second World War, where pollution levels were so high that we had what's called the aerosol effect, where the sun's um, radiation was reflected. And it actually caused cooling. Even though CO2 was rising, it caused cooling. And it was when that was clear that all of a sudden, the CO2 that had accumulated in the atmosphere suddenly took off, and that's why we had this very high rate since 75. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> you have an explanation yeah. for the current? Again, not or, is it, or is it a tired old myth, as you say? Well, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's actually very interesting. Uh, I'm seeing a whole new world here, because um, you said, uh, uh, what was it? What was quite interesting? Um, oh yeah, an almighty row. You said there's been an almighty row since 2009 about this. I, I don't read a lot of the same stuff you do. I haven't seen an almighty row. I'm sure there's an almighty row in the BBC and the Guardian and the Daily Mail. There's not an almighty row in, in scientific literature. There's simply a, uh, a study of what is happening to try to see what are the various short-term balances that are causing the troposphere not to warm as much as the IPCC can say. And this is not a, a difficult thing. There are anomalies, and again, coming back to uh, the, um, the idea of the thing of creationism, there are all kinds of anomalies in evolution. Uh, you can say, how can evolution happen solely by mutations? It's a very good point. Uh, there are now, we're beginning to discover other things that are driving evolution. So, yeah, you, you, um, you know, you'll find that in scientific literature, these things are much more sanguine than they perhaps are in the media and in the books and all the blogs. Uh, but there, there are beginning to be papers now, and in fact, there's a very recent one, which is a very interesting one, on how aerosols, because they're produced in the northern hemisphere, are actually having much more of an effect uh, than they would if they were global, because they're being focused on the area where there's most warming, and there's more, more warming in the northern hemisphere than the south for various reasons that I want to go into. So, uh, you know, these anomalies will, will um, come up for the next hundred years. There'll be things that the scientists have to find out how to go and cover. It doesn't mean that, that the science of what of CO2 causing warming is wrong. It just means that there are certain things that we still don't understand, but there are certain things we still don't understand in plate tectonics, things we don't understand in evolution. You will never get a science that explains every little last new shine perfectly. It's the things we know that are important. And the things we do know, and the, which the debate is not about, is that CO2 does cause warming. There's been a spike in, in um, temperatures because of it. It's happened for the last 500 uh, million years. And I don't know any scientist uh, who's actually researching who descends from that. I don't even put some of the on the phone. Okay. <laughs> 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 Um, if climate sensitivity, so doubling of CO2 by the end of this century, causes, let's say, 1.6 degrees of warming, would you be worried about that? I mean, if that became an established... Now, why are you saying, let's say, 1.6? What if I said to you that the higher end of the estimate is 10? There is a, there is a paper out there that, that said 10 degrees is being ignored by most people, but if I was writing a book about this, care less about my reputation. I say, ah, oh, no, 10 degrees in the morning. Why couldn't I say, well, let's say 10 degrees in the morning. And you would jump on me and you say, but why are you taking only one figure at the high end of the seven? And so I would, and then presumably you would say that to me, I'll put that back to you. Why are you only taking the figure at the low end of the scale and saying, fingers crossed, let's hope it's the low end. I mean, shouldn't we be doing what the science shows? And, and I've actually got a lot of um, a, a, a lot of papers here which are showing from historical records the way that climate has behaved in the past, that the range is is the most probable range is around two degrees. It's somewhere between two and a half and four. Now the IPCC estimate that you get, I don't use the IPCC. They're out of date and they get a lot of stuff wrong. They they and they're very conservative. The latest stuff which didn't get into the um, AR5 report because it was too late is actually showing that we are back on track with what has always been the central estimate, which is around three degrees. So you can say to me, you know, what if it's one half a second? What if it's one? What if it's half? What if, you know, God's in charge? Uh, <laughs> we can, you can speculate about everything. I get these yeah. early questions from creationists. 
But I think we need to go where the bulk of the solid science is. And the solid science is saying between two and a half, uh, two and a half, and four and a half, the most probable is around three. Nothing, nothing really has upset that. The only thing is that in a, a few new papers that have looked in the, into the aerosol effect concluded that it's actually a lot less than the score, and they're trying to find explanations as to why. So the IPC has just thrown up its hand and said, well, in that case, we won't put a best estimate on it. We've just put this huge range in. Uh, but I bet you the next time they're going to take into account all the new studies that have been done, they'll be back on track at three. So we could pussyfoot around for the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, waiting for every last dot to be put on the I and last slash on the T. But to be honest, there is as much evidence for CO2 causing warming as there is for plate tectonics causing um, uh, earthquakes, and as, as there is for um, evolution being the result of, of, of the animals and organisms we see today. Okay, another question before we go to the audience. I'm, I'm hoping we're going to go to the audience soon. Um, how realistic is it for ordinary people, you say, I mean, Let's face it, you are a science journalist, the case for a degree in, in a scientific subject. Um, sure, you know, you can, you, you know, I can type in scientific papers and the spread thing comes up. It might say, pay $32 now, you know, you're not doing this damn thing. Um, and I, you know, I read the abstract and I think, right, I don't even understand what the abstract is saying, so I'm not going to pay $32 for it. Sometimes they're free. But, you know, I, I have, you know, coming back to our original problem here, um, you know, I, I think a lot of things that you've said about some of the books that I've based in my 2009 talk on, you know, I'm, I'm taking all of that on board, but, you know, the actual, you're talking about hundreds of scientific papers, how realistic is it for people, you know, in, in this room tonight to actually read all of those papers, or even a tiny fraction of them, without some kind of intermediary, without, you know, yeah. just looking at your 10 minute, Really, for example. Well, I suppose one question is, do we really need everybody in the country to make a personal decision about whether it believes in science or not? How do we do that in everyday life? Do you do that with plate tectonics? I mean, you do that. I'm not sure how to believe plate tectonics. I'm going to read every paper there is and let's see what I think. Because it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be a massive controversy about it. There's no control, but that's the point. There is no controversy either about CO2 causing global warming. In the scientific papers, there was a study of thousands of these papers, and, and it was hard to find any that, that actually opposed the, 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 the basic premise that CO2 causes a degree of warming and has been the main driver of climate over the past 500 million years. There's very, I mean, there are a few percentages, I can name them, but I, you know, I mean, I can probably name the ones who. We don't believe in plate tectonics as well. Um, yeah, but getting back to your question, uh, you know, I don't think it's incumbent on us to to try to play citizen scientist. And, uh, there's a single citizen journalist, as an editor said to me once. He said, you know, the thing about citizen journalists, which I can also apply to citizen scientists. If you believe you would like to uh, copy and follow citizen scientists, would you like to have a root canal work done by a citizen dentist? <laughs> I, I think you don't need to play scientists. We've got perfectly adequate people who do that. The scientific system is set up with checks and balances. And it is flawed. You do get bad papers going in, you get mistakes being made, but the whole thing is self-correcting. Uh, because you get response papers, you get corrections, you get papers withdrawn, you get paper, papers rewritten. Um, the whole thing is debated there, and these are people that know the subject, know what they're talking about. Basically, by comparison, we know nothing, and I, I include myself. I, you know, I'm, my geology degree was in the 70s, when plate tectonics was still a hypothesis. So, uh, I, you know, I include myself there. I would not want to try and second guess what scientists uh, have concluded. I would just say, this is what they've concluded, and this is what thousands of them say, and this is the, uh, I hate to use the word consensus, because science is not run by consensus, but this is the uh, theory that in 110 years has not been falsified, going back to my daughter's paper. So the fact that people have not been able to disprove this, you can never prove something in science, but you can disprove it, and no one has been able to disprove it from all the books and all the blogs. So I would say trust the science. If you are interested in the subject, 
and tooting my own horn here, I think you should read New Scientist magazine, which gives a very, very good press here. And I'll tell you something, I work for the Daily Mail. Oh. <laughs> 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 you, the, only, the only paper that's ever told me to make up a quote for an interviewee that I couldn't get hold of. I've written for the Guardian, who fact check everything. And I've had to come back and say, you spelt this thing differently to the way that we checked it. And we spelt it every <laughs> uh, U.S. News World Report fact check very well, but the one that fact checks more than any is New Scientist, because I'm writing for people who are biotechnicians and rocket scientists and, and particle physicists. If I make a mistake in, in, in a paper, in, in an article, they're going to be straight on to New Scientist and let them know. Not only that, but my editor, in every case, whatever the story I was doing, if it was particle physics, my editor would be a particle physicist. So it's a, it's a paper that's scrupulous to good for this fact. If you want to know about science, why don't read that? <laughs> now, I did suggest you read textbooks, but I think you kind of weren't too keen on textbooks. I don't know why, but at least textbooks are fact checked. That's what we teach university students and school students. They're a great way to learn about science. And, and, and you know, since that's really the subject of the discussion tonight, I think that you'd be well served to do that. But please, if you are going to read the books and the blogs, then you're taking it upon yourself, the task, to fact check them. Because no one else has done that. And the easiest way to do it, as I said, it's not difficult. You don't need a science degree to, to look up their paper and then check it. Because the, the mistakes that I found were right there in the abstracts. They were very easy to spot. It didn't take me very long until once I got the source, it took me a couple of minutes just to check against the paper and, and find out where the misrepresentation and misquote had taken place. Okay, thank you very much. Right. So, thank we're now going to open this up to the floor, and uh, Simon has a microphone, which he's going to bring around. Uh, the rule is you're only allowed to speak if you have the microphone in your hand. So, uh, Simon, I'll give it to you. Thank you. Hi, there we go. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed that. I, I'd like to kind of pick up a little bit from, from what, what David said, and kind of pick up what, what you just said as well. Um, I, 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 I've got to admit, I struggle with it, not because I don't believe scientists or anything is true. I mean, you sit me in front of a creationist, I'll be quite happy to tell him in 10 minutes how his whole worldview's wrong. If you sit me in front of a climate skeptic, I wouldn't know what the hell I was talking about. And the problem is, and this is only my personal opinion, so you don't take it as your own, but the subject just isn't as interesting. I mean, there's so many different parts of it, and I understand it. I'm sure there's people that really enjoy it, but I just, I can't, I struggle with it. It's just, I don't know, it's not the most interesting subject. And picking up from what you said a second ago there, where you said, well, there is a consensus, you should trust it and everything else. Well, I agree, you should, and I'm not saying it's not true, but then we do live in a democracy where so when they come up with things like carbon tax, it has to be put in layman's terms that people and voters understand. You can't expect the average person to go, well, you know, it's a new scientist, because all you're creating is almost a scientific elite. You know, it's something it needs it's Brian Cox or it's Richard Dawkins to put it in London's terms so everyone can understand. And I no, I, I completely disagree with you to say, oh well just just disagree with the consensus. So I'm not I'm not a climate skeptic or anything, I'm just a climate a climate guy that struggles to stay awake when he reads any literature to do with it. Thank you. Well done for coming along to the I find it, I mean, my background is sort of theology and philosophy and all that stuff, and normally I'm debating whether Jesus is existing and all that. Um, but I have found this subject, you know, so much more to learn, but I have found it really fascinating because there are so many different dimensions of it. Just looking at all of the different geological epochs and trying to get your, just trying to remember what the Phaleozoic is and the Pliocene and the Pleistocene epoch and how many, you know, 500 million years of this and that and the other. And then you start looking at so, um, uh, the physics of the sun. Um, again, it's, it's really fascinating stuff. So, you know, don't get up on it. Um, it's, I, I, would, I would say if you, if you try, you'd actually find it really interesting. I, I just uh, I mentioned the yeah, you talked about the carbon tax, and I, I think that's a very legitimate question, because people are concerned that they're going to have to pay for this, and they want to make sure the science is right. But I would say, you're actually paying through the nose all the time for science. Uh, germ theory, do you believe in it? Do you not believe in it? Have you studied it? Well, think of what the NHS bill is in this country, and it's founded, uh, most of it, on germ theory. 
we're, we're going through the nodes, hoping that the scientists have got it right, that the germ theory is correct. Um, and there are even a lot of doctors now who dispute the link between HIV and AIDS. So, uh, well, what if they're right? Then we're spending a whole load of money and giving a lot of money to third world countries for these programs when the science might be wrong. Um, I don't think you can really uh, sort of look in your pocketbook uh, in, in that sense because ultimately, if you say, well, I give up on the whole thing, I'm, I'm not so sure because I don't want to pay for this, you'll be paying eventually anyway. It's rather like I can put it akin to um, half a dozen roofers telling you if you don't get that leak fixed in your roof, it's going to come down and, and wreck the house. And you say, well, I'll just wait 50 years and I don't want to pay hundred pounds now for the roof to be fixed. Let's just see what it's like in 20 years' time. Because 20 years down the road, if we get the kind of sea level rise, just the sea level rise alone that we're looking at, the cost is going to be phenomenal. I, I've actually got a, a graphic on that because there was a study done of all the cities at risk, at risk and the dollar cost of just the sea level rise. Nothing to do with salination, with hurricanes or anything else. Sea level rise alone would be a trillion dollar trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, and if you want to uh, ask afterwards, I can show you the figures. But uh, that's basically it. I wouldn't call this catastrophic climate change. I don't use the word catastrophic. It's expensive climate change. I think we've got to get it into our heads. We're not going to escape this by simply saying, well, I don't want to believe this. I don't want to pay for it. You pay for it, or your kids will pay for it, or your grandchildren will pay for it. You're fine if you don't have any of those. I <laughs> have. David, I'd be interested to know whether you um, believe that smoking is, there's a link between smoking and cancer, and whether, if so, you made an equal study and, uh, of the science behind that link, that supposed link, and uh, whether further you think that the government should be firing a lot of money into the proposition that there isn't any link. Because there either is a link or there isn't a link. There either is a, is a, there either is a God or there isn't a God. You know, these are these are total questions. What is right? What is wrong? So therefore, we should have the uh, both sides equally investigated. Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm not surprised that this is come up because Matt and I often have this discussion. <laughs> um, I mean, I I haven't studied the the history of the dispute between people saying that there's a link between smoking and lung cancer. But one side was funded by the tobacco companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I, my general feeling is that it's just too easy to say, to, to put this in the same category. Um, maybe a lot of, maybe Peter does, maybe you do. I think it's just a bit too facile to put this in the same category. Uh, can I make a comment on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, actually, there's far more evidence linking CO2 and temperature than there is between uh, cigarettes and lung cancer. Cigarettes and lung cancer, the evidence is pretty much uh, statistical. The link between CO2 and temperature can be measured. You can actually do it in the laboratory. It's solid. There's, there's much more solid than that. But it's interesting that you, you should bring that up because there was a scientist in the 1980s who uh, got money from the tobacco industry to show that there was no link between uh, um, tobacco and um, lung cancer. He got paid an awful lot of money to do this, he lectured everywhere, he wrote books and papers about it, and he was an environmental scientist. And he's the same guy uh, who David was from. <laughs> <laughs> David Singer, who now is taking money from the oil companies to promote the idea that there's no link between CO2 and temperature. So the parallels are actually very interesting and we have the same guy arguing exactly the same thing for most all that. Well, it seems to me that in a sense this is um, uh, the wrong debate. Uh, in a way that um, the carbon is sequestered carbon. It's carbon that comes from fossil fuels. And carbon dioxide is produced by burning, you know, getting things. I and mean, that's not the issue. It's taking fossil fuels and burning them. That's the, 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 that's the problem. Taking sequestered off, um, carbon dioxide and releasing it back into the atmosphere. But that's a finite resource. But, I mean, in a sense, um, the debate should be what we can do when the fossil fuels run out. I'm going to run out very quickly. 
Further should be steadily increasing, and if, if we've got a plateau situation, then in fact it, it's a, a cooling in effect because the uh, uh, because it, it, the the world would naturally heat up as a result of uh, the further we get away from the ice age. Now, what we should be considering is if we have another meteorite or more volcanoes, uh, what are we going to do with uh, global cooling? Okay, but, um, I'm going to have to correct a lot of premises in your question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just my job. Um, first of all, we are in an ice age. Uh, technically, what you're talking about is a glaciation. I know that it's a technical point, but it's important to know the difference because there have been several ice ages in the Earth's history. And the last glaciation, there have been several of them over the last few million years, and the last one ended sort of around 10,000 years ago. We then reached a, a, a situation that the snow's equilibrium uh, for obvious reasons. What happens is that, uh, first of all, it's not caused by meteorites. That was a theory when I was at, uh, at, at college, and, and uh, it, it seems to be very clear that this is caused by what are called the language cycles. And these are tilts and wobbles in the Earth's orbit that increase the amount of insulation you get from the sun. And that small amount of insulation, that's that tiny amount of insulation, I think it's 0.7 watts per square meter, is enough to start the ball rolling on what's called positive feedback. Now what you get from a small amount, like a trigger of warming, is that ice begins to melt. As the ice melts, less sun is reflected off the white ice. It opens up dark areas of ocean, so more energy is absorbed, and that warms a little bit more. You also get, uh, with every, uh, I think it's 7.5% uh, increase in uh, the amount of, um, I, I have got the figure in my head, so I can't remember it, but basically the more water vapor you get in the air, because warmer temperatures can hold the water vapor, water vapor is also a greenhouse gas, so that causes more. So it was these triggers, these little tilts in the orbit of the language cycle that caused uh, the warming. Now, the next one that's due is about 16,000 years from now. So theoretically, we should be entering another glaciation, another glaciation 16,000 years from now. Uh, that's pretty much academic, because by that time, if, if, uh, if we burn all the CO2, there's not going to be another one. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, what happened when we came out of the glaciation was that all of these positive uh, feedbacks came into effect and we end up with a situation of equilibrium. They play each other out until the amount of radiation leaving the Earth equals the amount coming in. That's a radiation balance, an energy balance. So basically over the last few thousand years we've had a pretty equitable climate. We've had, we've had uh, increases, there was during the Roman period, there was a, a, a warming. Uh, of course we've had cooling periods, we've had a warming during the war period and a cooling period. I say, you do get these fluctuations, but they're very gradual. They're very gradual, and they have all been accounted for by changes in the sun. The sun has been the phosphor early, because carbon dioxide has been really level. All of a sudden, carbon dioxide goes shooting up, and the temperatures go shooting up, which is, of course, what you would expect, because there's a link between the two. Uh, well, you're shaking your head. Uh, I don't hear why that's <laughs> not true. Yeah. We've had um, volcanoes ejecting a lot of uh, uh, volcanic ash into the atmosphere. Yeah. And that is uh, cut out the sun for two or three years and caused uh, plants to die and a massive famine. You mentioned the whole ice age and there's been another uh, uh, cold period where people have died, animals have died because there's no plants, because the, the, the uh, sun has been cut out. And this will happen again. We should be preparing for a uh, global cooling, which is dangerous because people will starve, where it's global warming, generally speaking, uh, plants will grow bigger, be more remain in the atmosphere. Can uh, I answer that? No, 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 the no, 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 the no, 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 the no, 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 and so global warming is not much of a uh, problem. Global cooling is an absolute disaster. Yeah, I, I, I don't quite follow this. Well, there's two points here. One is that volcanoes are going to go all over the place and cause global cooling. From time to time, they do. But, I, but they always have. So yes. I'm not sure why you think all of a sudden we're on the, on the eve of this great capitalism of global cooling. 
Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Oh, yellow, you're talking about Yellowstone. Well, not oh, okay. Yes. Yellowstone is one of the best. That's, okay, that's not a volcano. That, that's, um, um, oh, they call that. So there's a word for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. No, no, no. It, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a different type of thing to a volcano. But basically, it, yeah. yeah, this happens every 600,000 years. Um, yeah, the, the, um, there's, a, there's magma under Yellowstone, yeah. and yeah. it's going to it's going to open up. But you know, and it causes a volcano. Yeah, like I said, there's nothing we do about that. We should be preparing for global, 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 global cooling. Well, when is this going to happen? And I'll oh, no. all the okay, but there are there are all sorts of things. There there, there, are, there are going to be earthquakes. There are going to be asteroids. Yeah. yeah. But um, what, I, what I don't understand is how why you think this is going to be happening in the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, or 1,000 years. Okay, two Ken, thousand. I think we'll have to move on from okay. the subject okay. and uh, pass it on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you said that um, you don't like to use the word catastrophic in mm -hmm. connection with climate change and uh, not the standard for a large school. So, uh, isn't it possible, uh, because of the, the uh, positive feedback that you mentioned, mm. uh, that this could be um, entirely catastrophic or life on the planet, or human life on the planet? Well, yeah, I mean, the reason I don't use the word catastrophic is simply because I don't know what it means. Um, and David, and you forgive me for going back, and I, I think actually David's been a real sport, I have to say, <laughs> in opening his mind to this, because, because we did have disagreement over things he said, and, and I said, look, I promise you, I'm not going to thrash you on this. But there was an interesting thing that you said, and it, 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 it has to do with this nomenclature, because uh, basically you said, well, we're expecting a two feet rise in sea levels, which will flood um, half of Bangladesh. But David said, this is not a prop, this is not catastrophic, this is a problem. Well, then we were just dealing with, well, if, in, if half of England was going underwater, would it be catastrophic or would it be a problem? I think we get into an argument about what to call it. And the problem was that in the past, most so-called skeptics disagreed with anthropogenic climate change. They said there's no such thing. And AGW was the in word. A few years ago, that changed to CAGW, and all of a sudden they started slipping in this word catastrophic, and they were like, yes, okay, it does cause warming, but it's not going to be catastrophic. Well, it depends what you mean by catastrophic. Is half of your country being flooded catastrophic, or is it a problem? I don't care what you call it, I'm only interested in what is actually the effect. I don't know, you know, I, I, don't, I, think, I think to hyperbolize this and say, you know, the human species is headed for extinction, all this other thing. I think that tends to put people off because they think, oh, okay, here we go. If people think about this problem when they realize exactly what's going to happen according to the science and how much it's going to cost and how much it will affect them personally. And I think that is the way to convince people that this is a problem that they should be dealing with. And I'm happy to call it a problem. I, I, I might personally think it's catastrophic, I just wouldn't say so. <laughs> I'm conscious there are lots of questions on this side, of course, so we're Quite a dramatic one, about 200 feet at 
the end of the last glaciation, and certainly there was no triggering of volcanoes. So that suggests that's not true. It still would suggest it's not true. I would have to see the paper, if there is a paper, on which that's written. If it was a story in the Daily Mail, my information is to be sceptical. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. I'm sceptical until I can actually see, you know, um, I'm just hearing this from you for the first time, so I couldn't tell you. Okay, the other one is this, which I can give you the source. Did, have you mentioned earlier, because I missed the beginning, that there's been no global warming in recent, the last 10 years or so? Yes, I've been smacked to death on that one. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you given the reason as to why it is? Well, um, I, I was actually interested to hear from David what I did was ask David, because the, the, even the sceptics do now accept, and I'm using sceptics in the, the, the sense that David would use it, the, the, the climate science critics, as I like to call them, they accept that they're, they're, they're CO2 does have the effect of warming the planet uh, about 1.75 to 2 degrees for doubling the CO2 from pre-industrial levels. Now, if they do accept that CO2 causes warming, they must have an explanation. Well, do, 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 but, I, well, I can you tell you what, but I know that, yeah. yeah. Because um, the heat from the whole world in the last 10 or so years has been driven, pulled back by the trade winds and the Pacific into the ocean. Yeah. Certainly, that, well that's called INSO, the, um, the southern, uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's a, it's a phenomenon whereby basically the oceans act like a, um, a heat sink. There's that's far that. more warming more goes on in the oceans than, than in the troposphere. I mean, we're all so focused on the troposphere, we're all worried about, oh, temperatures going up and down in the troposphere. In fact, it's the ocean that's taking over 90% of the heat that's coming in. And what tends to happen is it sucks the heat out of the atmosphere and then occasionally it blows it back. When it sucks it in, it's called the La Nina, and when it blows it out, it's called El Nino. Now, the 1998, which calls that big spike in global temperatures, that the so-called skeptics love because it's so high that everything after that looks like a decline. <laughs> Uh, that was caused by a very, very strong El Nino. It was the ocean giving back so much of the heat that it had been taken in. Now, the last 10 years, there have been some very strong La Ninas, which have been taking, um, taking heat from the atmosphere and diving it down into the oceans. It, so the thing that is not as puzzling scientists is not whether or not CO2 is causing warming. It's how the heat is being distributed in the Earth. But did you come across the fact that when the heat goes back into the atmosphere in X million years time, the warming could be very rapid. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then the ice sheets will melt very quickly. Well, I don't know about the melting ice sheets, but that would be a given, I would think. But, but certainly the, the next, the next El, El Nino that's going to happen, if once the, the, the ocean starts giving back all this heat that's been sucked out of the atmosphere in the last few years, that will be very strong. Now, you have to remember, because the sun has been weakening over uh, the last, what, 10 years or so. The sun? Uh, yeah, the sun. It, it's been, uh, we've had a, one of the weakest uh, solar cycles for a long time. Um, and so we've been having a combination of effects. You've had a weaker sun, you've had uh, the Enso effect, the, the La Nina effect, the oceans absorbing the heat, and also the aerosols, uh, pollution being caused by China and India industrializing. All of this has had a measurable cooling effect on the Earth. The question that really you need to ask anybody who's a skeptic is, well, why do we have these very high temperatures still remaining when everything should be sending these temperatures down? The only explanation, as everybody uh, in the science world knows, is that CO2 is having that effect. So the, the question about you know, exactly where the heat's going is really the argument about what's happening over the last 10 years, not about whether the CO2 causes warming. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering about how much uh, your sort of science allows you to forecast things and how much of it's just sort of measuring things for other uh, people to sort of deduce things from. Yeah, I, you know, one thing, I, there are two things I don't do in my, two things I don't do in my um, uh, YouTube uh, channel. One is to quote the IPCC. I never do that because people will uh, so much confident about the IPCC. And it, it's only reviewing papers, it doesn't do any research. And um, the other thing that I don't do is computer models. Uh, because I don't understand them. I don't even understand the computer here that I'm setting up. And if I don't understand it, I can't say that this computer model is correct or not, because everyone will say, well, it's all garbage in garbage out. So I, I much prefer to stick with the subject I know, which is geology, and say, well, uh, you see, there are so many different disciplines involved in climate science. It's 
not just climatologists, geologists are involved as well, and glaciologists, and uh, um, so physicists. So there's, there's a lot of different disciplines involved in this. Computer modeling is just one aspect of this. And I find if I bring up subject to computer models, people always complain that the models might, might be wrong. So they all right, won't mention them. Let's just go back to what we knew before the year 2000. And we knew enough then to know the effects of CO2. So if we look at the past and see the effect that CO2 is having in the past, we can look to the future and see that, you know, we know pretty much what's going to happen. And by the way, one good example of that is sea level. Sea levels are not really computer model. Uh, sea level rise is calculated in two different ways. One is to look back and see how much uh, sea levels have risen for a given uh, rise in global temperature. And the other way is to work out the physics, because there's a lot of physics involved in not just the melting of the ice, but the expansion of the sea because of thermal expansion. As the sea gets warmer, it actually increases in volume. These are the two things that are driving sea level rise. And so you can actually work that out from basic physics. The two ways they've done this both came to the same conclusion that we're expecting a rise of about three feet by the year 2100. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of points to make. Uh, in one sense, perhaps the debate has moved on because, as you said, there's a general acceptance that carbon dioxide yeah, causes the temperature of the atmosphere to rise. So is the debate now really to what extent? Is it man-made? Uh, is it man-made? Mm -hmm. And in which case, what should we do about it? And then you mentioned earlier about the fact that if we don't do anything now, it will be incredibly expensive you know, gener in generations to come. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it the case now that, uh, yes, it will be expensive, but unfortunately, um, the only way we're going to have to adapt to it, rather than do anything about it, and the only way we'll be able to afford to adapt, adapt to it, is to have a sufficiently prosperous society to be able to pay for it. And that prosperous society can only be built on fossil fuels. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that's what you believe in, you're in. Well, I don't know if I believe it, I just wonder. It, yeah. it, it's rather like the open number about um, air conditioning, which is actually a good topic for the people yeah, in the room. Uh, the hotter it gets, the hotter the planet gets, the more people will be using air conditioning and burning fossil fuels to do that. But the more they put their air conditioning on, the hotter it's going to get. It is one of those paradoxes. I think we have to be intelligent as a species and say, at what point are we going to start taking action? Because the longer we delay action, as you quite rightly point out, the more difficult it's going to be to do that. Because not only do we now have to face the problem of mitigating, because even if we stop using car parks tomorrow, the, the heat that's already in the planet that's overburned is going to continue warming this planet up for decades to come. We are going to have to cope with that. At the same time, we are going to have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in order to cope with the heat that will be 50 years beyond that. It, it is a conundrum. I, I think the intelligent thing to do is to start. And I, I mean, I'm not necessarily someone who thinks that um, taking action on this is going to be a catastrophe. I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of, and I hate to turn the tables and say alarmist, videos from the fossil fuel industry, they've got these great videos on YouTube that say, well, if we take action on carbon, there's going to be no electricity, we'll go back to the Stone Age, we'll all be poor, people are going to die. I, I mean, in Australia, they have the carbon tax, I, I'm still alive, and in fact, um, I think most industries are doing quite well out of it. Uh, we, I think we are on the verge of a, of a revolution in, uh, in energy, but again, I'm getting away from my brief on, on science. I can tell you what the science is, this conundrum that you have about what to do about it, I'm afraid, the ball is in your court. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> so if um, the point that you were talking about general citizens, not necessarily being scientists, and I'm just thinking how important it is that people do have a bit of scientific literature. Oh, absolutely. Interesting, because the scientists aren't the ones making the decisions, mm -hmm. and the politicians, I don't think you should trust all the decisions for them. Mm -hmm. It's important that people know what's going on. And this theory, referring back to theory review papers, you know, you have to pay, you have to download them and pay for all of them. 
Yeah. So there has to be another way for people to be able to get good information rather than having to do it themselves back to the theory of papers. Well, as I said, yeah, these mm-hmm. scientists. Yeah. Yeah. These scientists might be one, but what I'm thinking is when people get most of their information from these scientists, it's something like the Today program that I listen to and hear, hear just opinions and no facts talking about. It's a favorite reason. The media, yeah. they need, um, I mean, perhaps you can think of some ways in which, say, the Today program could get its facts, the droughts in the Sahara, where, you know, Crops are failing. You know, this is happening already. You know, I work in the humanitarian area. It's stupid. we're having to make plans left, right, and centre for what to do about climate change in these places. And yet, most of these populations are emitting hardly any carbon dioxide. So when we're trying to decide what to do about carbon dioxide, you know, it's not just it's not just an agenda for what happens in England with the climate. You know, it's not that. Yeah, I, um, I'd like David to chime in as well if you wanted to, if you wanted to take those on. I've got a couple of answers. Well, we, we are kind of over time. We're, we're heading into some, some really big topics there. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I'd like to go on. Can I just give a quick answer to that? Because I don't know. Okay, very, very quick. Yeah, yeah, I, have to yeah I, I mean, the media, yes, I, I do agree. They, they, should, um, they should do more. And I think one of the problems in the media is they always feel they have to balance. So if they get, in America now, if they get a biologist on, they've got to get a creationist on to argue the other side. I'm afraid that's how they see the balance thing. CNN does that as well. And that's how they do it with climate change. And it's not surprising that people are confused about this because that's what they hear on the radio. Um, all I can say is you should listen to a program I used to report for called Science in Action where we didn't put both sides of the story, we put the science. And if there were coops out there who had other ideas about you know, intelligent design and everything else, they didn't get on the program. Uh, so that's probably the best way to do it. Censorship, that's the right. way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do just want to make one, one brief point about it. I, I, I do think we need to be careful about looking at extreme weather events around the globe and we're always saying, oh, well, it's the fault of CO2 emissions, you know. There have always been extreme weather events and there always will be. So, I, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, well, there's a flood here, there's a typhoon there. It's all our fault and it's because, you know, we're not taking it seriously. I think we do have to be careful about those kind of things. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. So we'll now take the closing statement. So, will you begin? Okay. Um, I'd like to rewrite my closing statement here. <laughs> I knew this was going to be tough tonight, and I think that it's been, you know, it's been a fantastic, can I say, journey for me over the last couple of months, you know, trying to prepare for this evening. Um, and it has been, you know, it's been quite tough for me. I, I want to start with, or not start, sorry, finish with a couple of quotations from the IPCC. I know you know, you're not all that keen on the IPCC, but in its fifth assessment report we read this, scientific hypotheses are contingent and always open to revision in the light of new evidence and theory. The distinguishing features of scientific inquiry are the search for truth and the willingness to subject itself to critical re-examination. We also read this amazing admission. People, including scientific experts, are prone to a range of biases that affect, that affect their judgment. In the case of expert judgments, there is a tendency towards overconfidence, both at the individual level and at the group level, as people converge on a view and draw confidence in its reliability from each other. Presentation, framing, context, and potential biases might affect their own assessments. Um, my reaction to, to you tonight, Peter, is that I'm super confident about you know the things that you've been saying. I'm not, you know, I, I don't feel that I that I share that, that confidence that you have about the so-called scientific consensus at the moment. I have moved some way from my 2009 to 
you're still available to each other if you want to read it. <laughs> or maybe we'll just forget about that. Um, I, was, I was trying to think of a, of a new word that I could use to describe my position if somebody were to say to me, are oh, you one of those terrible climate sceptics? Um, or even worse, a climate denialist. Um, I think I'd like to still say um, that I'm uh, an uncertaintist. So I'd like to... Uh, agnostic, <laughs> Well, I, I did consider agnostic, but I thought, no, that's not right, because agnosticism means we can't know. I mean, I, I do think that we can know, but I still think there's a lot of uncertainty in the science. I don't share, you know, I'm, I'm still slightly alarmed by, uh, by Peter's certaintism, and I'd rather call myself an uncertaintist. So maybe you'd like to... Uh, um, uh, you might like to sort of consider whether that's your position as well. Uncert climate uncertainism. Um, I will leave that to you. Uh, we, could, we could go on all night, but uh, thank you very much, Peter, for, for, for coming to see us tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep this very brief because I've spoken so much already and I've been abusing the time that you've given me, so thank you very much for that. Um, I just address my confidence, no, that's just my sunny disposition. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we always say for confidence. Uh, in a sober analysis, of course, there are uncertainties in this science, and I did say this, I think, during my talk. I said there are uncertainties in climate science, but there are uncertainties in every science. There are uncertainties in plate tectonics, uncertainties in evolution. If I was standing in front of a, a bunch of creationists tonight, uh, which you're clearly not, and I was talking about evolution, I would be defending it just as vigorously, but I also would be admitting that there are a lot of things that we don't know. But you wouldn't expect me to stand up here and say, well, actually, we're not quite sure about it. The fossil record's a bit patchy, and yeah, there are things missing. We don't really know if we evolved. I would give you the confidence that I have that, yes, the fossil record is an absolute, almost cast iron guarantee that we evolved. I can say that with almost certainty. The one thing you can never ever say in science is that something is certain. Something is never certain. That's why we call it climate theory and theory of plate tectonics and the theory of evolution. These are always theories because they're models. They are totally unprovable. We could be having this debate 200 years from now when the sea level is lapping at the uh, front door and the temperature is five degrees higher and still be wondering whether the five times the amount of CO2 that's now in the atmosphere is the reason behind it. Because you will never be able to prove anything in science. But there are certain things that we know with enough surety to be able to say, yeah, this is pretty much a dead cert. And the link between CO2 and temperature, just like the link between um, earthquakes and, um, and by tectonics, uh, is as much a certainty as you're ever going to get in science. So yeah, you can argue about the little things. There's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how much there's going to be. There's a lot of uncertainty about what's causing the troposphere not to move upwards. And, and we're beginning to see now what those reasons are. So it's not like this is a completely incomparable and the whole thing has to be torn up and thrown away. There's 110 years of solid science behind this. And that's the confidence that I have in this. It doesn't mean arrogance. I am never at a position where I would say, I can say this with a hundred degree of certainty. There always has to be a door open. I think all I can say is that there is enough certainty about this that we don't have to keep debating this for the next decade, two decades, three decades ahead. We know that now.
And there's also a very congenial bar upstairs, although the drinks are slightly expensive. And hope to see you again at a future meeting. Thank you.